so great to be with you all. Okay, Susie. Great, and thank you, thank you. This is long overdue. Um, we have been trying to connect, what, for almost two years now, COVID hit, and you had promised to join us, and so thank you for staying patient and persistent. It is my honor and the honor of the CalRT organization to introduce our state superintendent, Tony Thurman. Um, I hope you enjoy listening to him as much as I have. So you're on. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. They told me I was supposed to talk for an hour and a half. So uh, now everybody's going to drop off of the Zoom, right? I'm just kidding. Uh, wherever you are, teachers and retired teachers, you're teachers for life. Um, let me just say thank you right up front for what you do, what you've done, and what you might still do. Um, we are, what a moment we are in right now. I am hopeful uh, that wherever you are, that you and your loved ones are safe and well as we try to navigate these most difficult times, the pandemic, having lost loved ones, seeing this incredible disruption of schools, of businesses, of our workplace, of our ability to be with loved ones. For those of you who are in communities impacted by wildfires, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for your resilience. I had a chance to uh, visit with some families in El Dorado County. Um, and I have to tell you, it was, you know, meeting folks who've lost their homes in the Caldor fire. Um, when I arrived, all I saw was resilience. And all I saw were teachers working with students in libraries, creating creative ways to continue to support learning for students, even though the school community and the school buildings had been burned down to the ground. It was an honor to be able to bring resources uh, to that community, hotel vouchers and gas vouchers and food and, and books. We brought books for our kids and they were so excited. The children were from ages three to 14. Mm -hmm. And so it has been more than a difficult 18 months for all of us. We have seen so much in addition to the pandemic and wildfires. Over the course of the last 18 months, we have seen some of the most awful acts of hate take place in our state, in our nation, and in our world. We've watched the killing of George Floyd literally play out on our television. We've watched a spike in hate against Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, communities. We've seen bullying of LGBTQ plus youth. We've seen attacks on trans youth in other states. And I'm grateful that we're in California, but these things we know have an impact on our youth. Oh my. I had a chance to visit in Pomona. It's going so fine. I, I had a chance to visit just a few weeks ago in Pomona, uh, a place where unaccompanied minors are living um, and being taught. Um, you know, all these things we are dealing with and our incredible educators are providing such support to our students. And so thank you. Hello what, there. We can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, Susie on, Dixon, get off there. And now I can't get up to the top. You're on the right place. Uh, we're able to hear Ooh. you. <laughs> you're at the right place. And Something's um, going on. Is that Elise who's uh, reaching out? Can we help you get set up? We can hear you on the Zoom and we're glad that you're here and we're happy to help you. And I just wanna say thank you to all of our educators, current teachers, retired teachers, uh, future teachers. Um, in all of this, 10,000 schools have reopened. Uh, what a time for us uh, to open our schools. Uh, you know, and I have been to probably a, at least a dozen uh, school openings since July. It's been amazing to be on campuses, to see the energy of students and families as we return to school and the excitement for everyone about coming back. Um, in most cases, our schools have returned upwards of 90 percent. In some cases, upwards of 95 percent of our students have returned for in-person instruction. We know that that's important for them. But at the same time, the Delta variant is an incredible threat to our well-being, and many of our communities are more susceptible to COVID infection. Many of us live with underlying health conditions where we have to be concerned, and that this has turned into almost a pandemic of the non-vaccinated, that we're seeing that 99% of those who are experiencing serious consequences, including death, unfortunately, have been without a vaccine. And we're seeing that our children 
now more than we've seen before are being hospitalized or having serious conditions. And so I wanna encourage you, um, this is not political speak. This is because I care and I want everyone to be well. If you can get a vaccine and you have kids who are 12 and older, please, uh, in your family, please have them get a vaccine because we're seeing these variants are really attacking. And so I say all this to say, again, in my message of thanks, um, your colleagues who are in the classroom right now are experiencing the most difficult challenge. They are trying to teach kids who want to be back, who deserve to be back, but having to deal with quarantine conditions. And many of you have talked to me. I see some names of friends here. I know that you all reached out about concerns where um, schools haven't had enough options to help families that either aren't ready to come back or can't be back because they have to be quarantined. We've had these incredible conversations about how to make this new independent study work better. There's some who said, Tony, you can't make it work better. Get rid of it. Just give us distance learning. All that's my way of saying our entire education system is trying to do something that's never been done before. Uh, maintain classes in the midst of a, of, of a worldwide pandemic, keeping people safe, um, and finding a way to make sure that kids can get a quality education. It is bumpy to say the least. We've had conversations, many, myself, the governor, uh, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond, one of the greatest education researchers ever anywhere, all are having conversations, the legislature, about what can we do about these massive staffing shortages that we are seeing that are impacting our schools and their ability to provide learning in this time, especially for students who are quarantining at home. It has been daunting. And to be honest with you, it's still being worked on. Our legislators are still voting on things that could help, but others feel maybe won't go far enough. And so we got to keep working, keep working, keep working. Uh, the governor has, through executive order, made it easier for some retired teachers to be able to come back to the classroom sooner uh, with, with fewer, you know, um, with less timed period to wait and with no penalty to retirement. We want to make sure, you know, as someone who has the honor of serving you on the CalSTRS board, we want to make sure that we create no consequences to any retiree who says that they would come back and help at a time when we have a massive teacher shortage, a massive shortage of classified staff. Every district is feeling the pinch because even non-classroom based staff administrators are helping with contract tracing and COVID testing, because this is just something that has never been in our lane in the educational space. You just have my deepest thoughts. Many of you know my story. You know that teachers have played an important role um, in my life. Uh, before you is the son of uh, immigrants from uh, Panama, Colombia, Jamaica. My dad was a Vietnam vet who uh, was from Detroit, who I never really knew because he went off to war and never came home until I found him on the internet as a grown man. And he talked about the trauma that he experienced uh, in the war and why he separated from his family and never returned uh, because of the trauma that he experienced in the war. My mom, uh, an immigrant from Panama, uh, emigrated to uh, California and ultimately was a teacher uh, in San Jose, California. Shout out to all my San Jose uh, retirees in San Jose folks. Um, and, uh, and so for me, uh, life began in San Jose where my mom taught and raised her four kids. Um, but my mom was very, very sick. My mom lost her battle to cancer when I was six years old and we all got split up and two kids stayed in San Jose, myself and my younger brother, we got shipped off to Philadelphia where we were raised by a cousin who we met for the first time the day that we showed up on her doorstep. Uh, in 1974. I'll never forget the date. Um, my cousin raised us as her own sons and she saved our lives. And uh, she didn't have a lot of formal education at the time, but she knew that education was a game changer. And she insisted that we get a great education and a great public education. Let me be clear. Uh, and she uh, ensured that. My cousin also was an immigrant from Panama. She worked as a nurse's aide just like my aunt did and my grandmother. And, you know, they, they work to clean homes. Um, they work to take care of others as a way of earning money to care for our family. And so they've opened doors for me and for many, many others, uh, opportunities that I would not have had. My cousin insisted that we get the best education. And so growing up in Philadelphia, a city that at the time was racially segregated, I was part of the desegregation program. 
Uh, I attended I attended my first uh, two or three years in my neighborhood school, which is an almost 100 percent African-American community. Uh, the great neighborhood of West Oak Lane in Philadelphia, um, where, you know, teachers pushed me. Um, and then we became part of a desegregation busing program. And as an elementary school student, I was bused 45 minutes each way. And I would spend the rest of my school career that way, being bused into a neighborhood that was an all white neighborhood, but that had a very diverse student body. Students bust in from all over the city. And I'll just say this. In spite of all those challenges, in spite of growing up on the free lunch program, I was embarrassed to admit it. I had an orange ticket. They made fun of me for having the free lunch program. Everyone in my school ended up being on the free lunch program. I was on public assistance. Government cheese, as you all have heard, I've eaten so much government cheese that I thought that USDA was a brand name. But these were the public programs that helped my family to overcome poverty. And no program more important than education helped me in my effort to overcome my humble beginnings. And I've had incredible teachers. And I never had a teacher coddle me or tell me I couldn't do it. I never had a teacher tell me that I wasn't cut out to go to college or to have a great future. My teachers all gave me a promise. They made a promise to me that my life would be better than it started if I believed in education. They may not have used those words, but that's what they were pushing. That's what they were selling. And as a student, I bought it. And I believed it. And the promise they made was true, that education would open doors and would be a game changer for me in my life. And it, it opened doors to discovery about myself, a lifelong passion for learning, and a desire to help my community to be better, to help others in the way that I was helped. Education made that possible for me to change my whole life, to go from being a quiet, shy kid who started life with difficult circumstances, to getting an education and going to college and graduate school and becoming a 20 year social worker and having the chance to work with foster youth and young people who were in the criminal justice system and with people with disabilities to be able to be an advocate and along the way become a city council member, school board member, state legislator and now state superintendent. I am grateful for what education has meant. I'm grateful for those messengers of change for me in my life. My teachers, my educators, they saw me as a student with promise and potential. They weren't like these folks who say, focus on the ones that show promise and potential because my teachers understood like all teachers understand, every student has potential. Every student has promise. It's our responsibility to help them to build, our responsibility to help our students refine and to help them overcome circumstances that they are experiencing. So I'm grateful to my educators for what they've done for me and all the educators that I see and what they've been doing. Throughout my entire political career, I've had the good fortune of teachers like Terry Jackson, who's working for us now at the California Department of Education, tell me what I need to know from the perspective of a classroom teacher to let me know how these policies will affect our kids for the better or not in, in good ways. I've had the opportunity to hear from teachers who uh, from the United Teachers of Richmond. That was my first introduction to education. Even though I was a city council member and not voting on anything related to education, the folks at the United Teachers of Richmond adopted me and they started talking to me about education. And so when I made the decision to become a school board member, it was already a relationship where I could talk to teachers and Gray Harris and so in, in Alameda, so many great teachers that I can talk about who shared with me, who poured into me to help me be a better legislator and ultimately make the decision to become state superintendent. As we are at this moment, this, this reflection point uh, in our nation's history about where education goes, I believe that we will build back better. In spite of the challenges we face, I believe that we will build an education system that's better than what we had before. An education system that recognizes that students have great needs and we have to address their social emotional learning needs. Uh, and I'm grateful for the work we've done with the governor and the legislature, $4.3 billion for mental health, $3 billion for community schools. Uh, we're going to have universal meals so any hungry kid can get a meal regardless of their financial background. No paperwork to get in the way. Anyone wants a meal, get a meal. In the pandemic, at the height of it, we served 500 million meals uh, to uh, our hungry students. Thank you to our classified staff and others who helped to make that happen. Um, we have universal TK. This is our universal preschool 
for all four-year-olds. And we have record investments for child care, especially for our youngest children. As a parent of two kids who've attended public schools uh, their whole life, I'm so grateful that we have these investments so that we can build back better. And we have to make equity our focus. We have to make sure we serve those who are the least amongst us. We have to make sure we address bias in our classrooms because bias exists everywhere. Uh, I'm excited that we're talking about ethnic studies. AB 101 is a bill that just passed that creates an ethnic studies uh, graduation requirement. This gives an opportunity for our students of color to learn about the contributions of their ancestors to make this a great state and to learn about great educators who've done great things. Um, I'm excited about our work to diversify the teacher workforce. Uh, I think that we have a beautiful diversity in our student body in the state, and it doesn't quite reflect our workforce. Uh, we have great folks from all backgrounds who do a great job with our students. But if we add to that with more diversity, we know that that will have benefits to closing once and for all this opportunity gap, the achievement gap, as it's been called. I call it the opportunity gap because I believe that all of our students can achieve. But we have to address the barriers in their way poverty, uh, health issues, uh, homelessness. And so I say all this to you that I believe that we are poised to build a better system and to bounce back from the pandemic, but we may need a few years. Uh, we will need to bring in more programs focused on literacy, making sure all of our kids learn to read by third grade. We can do this. And these are the places that I intend to center my superintendency this year and if I'm elected again after this year to continue making sure that in the next few years, we can say that we can keep the promise that every student who enters our schools will be able to learn to read by third grade. Why do I bring that up? Because you all know when you learn to read, you can read to learn anything and it will carry you uh, wherever you want to go. So you'll hear me talk about a statewide literacy effort. You'll hear me talk about computer science. Uh, I just want to say Thank you to all of you as I'm about to get the hook. I see I'm getting the hook. I want to say thank you to you for what you all have done. And I want to invite retired teachers to be part of the conversation about what we do going forward, how we build back better. Our families who receive services to students with disabilities are struggling because we know special education wasn't intended to be delivered through distance learning. And even though the federal government has said that we can, we know that we have to find ways to ensure that our students get what they deserve. And I'm grateful for the massive investment, historic investment we have in our state budget for special education. But we need help from retired educators to help us think through these challenges, our recruitment challenges, how we keep equity in the center. So thank you. I'm going to uh, turn it over to you, Susan, and, uh, uh, and thank you for giving me this space to share. And I'm happy to take any questions um, that you or any of your colleagues may have for me. Oh, thank you so much. Um, we are so honored. And what we've asked is if you have questions, if you could put it in the chat, um, I will follow up with your office. And we just so, so much appreciate you taking the time with your busy work schedule. I've seen you all over the state. I noticed that you are, <laughs> it's like, where's Waldo? Where's Mr. Thurman today? You are doing a, a great job getting out and motivating our existing um, current teachers. And that's one of the things we've been talking about as retired teachers, we haven't stopped learning and we can sympathize with the virtual platform. <laughs> we've had many glitches and we hope that um, some of our retirees do return. So thank you for that legislation to help move forward. But thank you again. And um, I know everybody is giving you a round of applause and I hope to see you in Sacramento again soon in person. Thank you, Susan. I just noticed the last chat uh, message asking me if uh, you all can help with contact tracing. That actually is a brilliant idea. And if there's, can we follow up to see if there are folks who want to help? Because districts are really uh, just struggling with the weight of trying to do the contact tracing. And that would be significant if we could find ways for your members who want to help in those ways, uh, it would be significant. Um, I'm sure there are other ideas, but I, that one jumped up right to the top. Uh, let us find a way to, to work together. That sounds great. I will get a hold of Abel and um, follow up. We can see what we can do. It's Thank great. you. Thank great you so much. Take great care. You too. Stay healthy, everyone. <laughs>